thank you, Mike. And thank you, musicians, too, for that, those wonderful songs that we sung together. Just think of those words. Um, speaking of Jesus, who once was slain, who once was killed, to reconcile man to God, to reconcile human beings to God. And today, I want to speak about the cross of Jesus, how Jesus died so that we could be reconciled to God. And reconciliation is a beautiful word. It means that people who were once separate can come together in love. People who are once enemies can be made friends. People who are once suspicious of each other can be brought together in trust and in unity. I just want to start with an example of reconciliation from history, just so you can see what a beautiful thing it is. You can all tell me that man? Abraham Lincoln. That's right. Abraham Lincoln was a great president. He was the man who led America to set the slaves free. But there were many people who did not like Lincoln. And uh, that man there on the top left, his name was Stanton. He said Lincoln was an imbecile, a nutcase, a stupid man. He called Lincoln a long-armed creature. You know? <laughs> Monnet, if you speak Bahasa, an ape. He was abusive to Lincoln. American politics hasn't changed, has it? But Lincoln had a big heart. And during these difficult times in American history, the Civil War, Lincoln saw that Stanton was a gifted man, a clever man. So Lincoln chose Stanton to be part of his cabinet. Even though Stanton had abused the president, the president said, you come and join me, become part of my cabinet, we can work together. Lincoln saw in Stanton the man he needed and almost immediately a deep intimacy started to grow. See, two men who could have been enemies because of Lincoln's big-heartedness, kindness, it brought the men together. And then you know how when the Civil War was finished, Lincoln was assassinated. He was shot. And he died the next day. And Stanton, the man who once said that Lincoln was a big ape, said, now Lincoln belongs to the ages. There lies the most perfect ruler of man the world has ever seen. He was changed from an enemy into a loving, devoted friend. That's reconciliation. Enemies to friends. And gee, my wife and I were reading this in, Bible, in our daily Bible notes. It says, reconciliation is a beautiful thing. A beautiful thing to come together. And I would like us to read together from the Bible about reconciliation. And today I want to take some words from St. Paul, who was a man who lived to make the gospel of Jesus known. So Paul was the first of the great missionaries. Well, not the first, but he was um, a wonderful missionary who wrote these words about 20 years after Jesus had lived and died. And I'd like you to read them with me. This comes from 2 Corinthians. Anyone who is joined to Christ is a new being. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. 
Our message is that God was making all human beings his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins. He's given us the message which tells how he makes them his friends. Here we are then, speaking for Christ as though God himself were making his appeal through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, let God change you from enemies into his friends. Christ was without sin, but for our sake, God made him share our sin in order that, in union with him, we might share the righteousness of God. Great words. Thank you for reading them with me. I use the Good News Bible when I read my Bible. And where the Good News Bible says God has made us his friends, other versions, other translations of the Bible say God has reconciled us. So just to quickly flick through these verse, verses again. God who through Christ reconciled us to himself, he gave us us the task, says Paul, of reconciling others also. Our, messages, our message is that God was reconciling the world to himself. He has given us the message which tells how he reconciles people. Here we are then, says Paul, speaking for Christ. Be reconciled to God. These are great words. How can I summarize that section of Paul's letter? You know, Paul wasn't an, a, a, a European. Europeans tend to think A, B, C, D, E, logic from one step to the next. Paul was an Asian. He was a Jew. And the Jews often had different ways of thinking. They thought A, B, C, D, and the climax, the most important part, was in the middle. That's D. And then he repeats himself. And I think we can see that in the words that Paul wrote. So how can we summarize what St. Paul said about being reconciled to God? Here's a summary. In the middle is the climax. Verse 19. Our message is... God reconciles. God makes friends of people through the Lord Jesus Christ. God takes us who are sinful and enemies of his goodness and he brings us to himself as his children whom he loves. If you forget everything else that happens at Global Today, remember God reconciles. If you forget everything else I say, there's the climax. God reconciles people to himself. Then we move on either side. On the, you see the letters in green have a similar message. Our God-given task, says Paul, is to bring the story of reconciliation. Our task, our job, our vocation, our work, that's the most, most important thing we can do. Our task, our life's work, is to work to reconcile people to God, to tell people about them. Whether you're working in a kitchen or IT or a theology student or a pastor or whatever, if you're a follower of Jesus, then your task, your work is to make known the reconciliation of God. If that's our task, then our message is the same thing. Paul says, my message, what I want to tell people about is that God reconciles. Then move out again, verse 18. Paul says, now the proof of the pudding is in the eating. You've heard that saying? Paul says, I have proved in my own life that God reconciles. He says, we, 
we followers of Jesus, in our own experience, we have been reconciled to God. We have come to know the love of God revealed through Jesus Christ. The love of God shown at the cross. We have been reconciled to God. We are now God's friends. And at the bottom of the orange, Paul says, now this is why we plead. It's my own personal experience. It is my burden to plead with you. Be reconciled to God. And then the red letters on the outside, Paul says, now this is the effect of what God has done. Verse 17, when anyone is in Christ, that person is a new being a new creation. God makes us someone new, someone whom we had never been before. And as we look at that verse, it's as if on the cross, God took old things and he gives us new things. The old things, our sin, our state of being lost of being foreigners, of being separated from God. Our weakness, God has taken that and put it on Christ on the cross. And instead, God gives us the life of Jesus. We become new creations in Christ. In verse 21, the bottom line, same thing. Christ takes our sin. Christ was without sin. But for our sake, God made Christ bear our sin in order that we might share the righteousness of God. So we summarize these words of Paul. How can we see it in human lives? I'd like to tell you a story briefly, and then we can look at a brief video just to go over that. In the 1960s, some Canadian missionaries went to um, New Guinea, Irianjaya, to teach the story of Jesus to the people who lived there, to the tribes people called the Sawi people. And you can see there, it was Don Richardson, and he was speaking to some of these New Guinean tribes people. Now, they were always fighting with other villagers, with their bows and arrows. Okay, 1960, still bows and arrows, still fighting. They were always treacherous. They betrayed each other. They loved treachery. So they would befriend someone from another village, and then when that person wasn't expecting it, they'd kill him, and maybe they'd eat him. They were also cannibalistic. And Don Richardson brought the story of Jesus to these people, always fighting. And when he told them about the first Easter, he told them how Judas betrayed Jesus. And to his surprise, the people said, wow, wasn't Judas smart? Wow, he's the hero of the story. He did what we like to do. He betrayed Jesus. Judas was the hero. And Don Richardson found he could not explain to them what Jesus had done. Eventually, after several months, the people would not stop fighting. So he said to them, look, I'm going to leave. Unless you stop fighting, I'm going to leave and go somewhere else. His wife was a nurse, and the people liked them to stay. So they said, okay, we will Stop fighting. There's only one way. And one day, the two villagers, always fighting, they lined up. And one person from one of the villages brought his little child to the other village and said to his enemies, look, there is one way we can stop this war, this fighting, I will give you my child. And someone from the other village did the same thing. They brought their child to the first people, people of the first village, and they said, I will give you my child. 
they exchanged children. And the Christian missionary thought and said, can this really ever stop these people from fighting? And the people said, yes, these children are the peace children. We cannot fight having exchanged these children. And then Don, Don Richardson understood how he could now explain to these Sawi people how God had come to them and Jesus was the peace child. Jesus was God's peace child whom God gave to us so that our rebellion against God, our disobedience towards God, could be taken away and we could be made into the very children of God. Don Richardson said, will this really stop you fighting, supposing somebody hurts the, the, the peace child? And they said, no, as long as these peace children are with us, there will be no more war. And there wasn't. And recently, um, a few years ago, Don Richardson and his now grown-up sons went back to Irianjaya, and they found the villagers happy together. No more war, no more fighting. They had taken the gospel of Jesus, and it had changed their lives. And I've asked Don if he can just show us about six minutes of a clip of called Peace Child explaining the thing that happened when God brought peace to these people. It was 50 years ago when my mother and my father began an unforgettable journey. I was just seven months old when they moved deep into the jungles of Papua. We made our home among a small tribal group known as the Sawi. My dad learned the language, my mom treated the sick, all with the purpose of telling them about Jesus. But the people did not respond. The Sawi were headhunters. They were cannibals. They lived in a constant state of war. As time passed, we began to lose hope that the gospel would take root. My parents were faced with a decision. Finally, Dad explained to the Sawi that if they kept on fighting, we could no longer stay. But the Sawi were desperate to keep us around. So they finally agreed to make peace with each other. In order for that to happen, each Sawi village gave an infant, a baby boy, to their enemies. And this child became known as the Peace Child. It was through this unexpected exchange, buried deep in their culture, that my parents were given a perfect opportunity to share the gospel with the Sawi, to explain to them that God sent his very own Peace Child, Jesus, to make peace with us. It's been 50 years since that day, and we're very anxious to see how the Sawi are doing. It's uh, fairly early in the morning on June 23rd, and everybody's still asleep. And I'm, this is the day, I'm on my way. I was up pretty late last night making sure that I had everything I needed. I hope I haven't forgotten anything. I got quite a few gifts for people. I think I'm set to go. It's been almost 25 years now since I've been there. Uh, I don't know how much things have changed. It's possible that a lot of the people that I know are no longer alive. But uh, I think some of my friends will still be there and it's going to be an amazing reunion with them. Joining my two brothers, Shannon and Paul. My dad just turned 77, and this is his first time back in many, many years. 
So for our family, for my brothers and my dad and I, this is the trip of a lifetime. So now we climb. All we do is climb. Our tribesmen from upriver, and they're the ones who actually uh, paddled our family in on this very river. And a couple of three of these guys were actually the actual paddlers from that time. So I couldn't believe this. <laughs> He's so proud because he said, We gave them to the Sawi. Yeah, they're real proud because they said they gave up their mom and dad and gave them to the Sawi, <laughs> their enemy tribe. So, okay. Steve, yeah. Her father was one of the paddlers, and he he died, so she's taking his place. She's taking these, his place. These two women are the daughters of the paddlers who brought oh, okay. mom and dad. And they have their weapons in their canoes here to reenact the fact that they brought their weapons uh, because they were heading into enemy territory. So each person is here with a meaning. There, there's symbolism in each person's presence on this little uh, flotilla of three canoes. Just to take us to the same place where we landed. Yeah, to the very same spot. Normally you wouldn't hear someone say, it's great to see so many old people. Disease took its toll. Death from warfare took its toll. But now to come back and see that there are just throngs among the crowds of people. Throngs of people with gray hair and old enough that they have trouble walking along the trail. That's a special joy. So they've reached out and they've invited I think five tribes around them. So they're making themselves a base uh, because something really significant happened among them. And it seems like this has been implanted in the hearts of the Sawi that they aren't meant to just sit around enjoying Christ and getting fat and happy. The whole point is to reach out and share it with others. So they're doing that. It's, we're seeing it in action. Yeah. He's explaining he's from a remote village. And after the Bible was translated, someone brought the scriptures to him and he would so, that, that Isaac. Isaac. Yeah, he's, he's taking a Christian name called Isaac. They really rolled out the red carpet. Hundreds and hundreds of people from five different tribes were here. And for me, the emotion was just overwhelming. I think one of the things that struck me, maybe the most, was how many people grabbed my hand or gave me a hug, often with tears in their eyes, and said that they had been my close friend or playmate when I was little. And I was surprised how many of the older people are still alive who actually witnessed my parents' arrival. So it's amazing to see the legacy of God's grace through my parents and their obedient step of faith 50 years ago. Thank you, Don. It's a wonderful story, isn't it? That people who are at war, when they come, when they find Jesus as God's peace child, they come to peace with other people as well. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to reconcile his enemies, those who were opposed to him and were rebelling against him, to reconcile to himself, thus establishing peace between forgiven people and holy God. 
I, was reading an inter- I am reading an interesting book by three professors um, called It Keeps Us Seeking. This is an interesting book relating Christian faith and science. And they write this, It is good reason, for a good reason, that the logo of Christianity is a cross. St. Paul wrestles with complementary or different descriptions to convey, to explain the difference that Jesus' death makes. Because of Jesus' death, we are justified. We are put right with God. That's using the language of the law court, legal language. Because of Jesus' death, we are saved. That's in the language of rescue. There's a rescue helicopter. Because of Jesus' death, because of the cross, we are at peace with God. That is the language of well-being. Because of Jesus' death, we are reconciled. That is the language of family. How precious to be reconciled in family when we have disagreements. And of course, families always have disagreements. The fact that Jesus died for people in advance of the restoration, Jesus died when we were still enemies, is is proof of God's love. Jesus died. It was God, you could say, God's great gamble. We did not have to accept God's gift of his peace child. God gave his son, even though we could reject him. I think maybe the events in New Zealand of the last month or so, it might just help us to understand a little bit of the kindness, the grace, the love of God in giving us his son, his peace child. You know, I'm referring to that terrible event when all those people were shot in Christchurch. And we are aware that there is evil in the human heart. Yes, there is evil in New Zealand society. There is hatred. There is untruth. And one day that hatred and that untruth just broke out in an act of terrible wickedness when the innocent were killed as they worshipped in their mosque. And then for most of us in New Zealand, there is this sense of horror. The innocent who die. What a terrible thing. What a terrible thing has happened in this country. And maybe there is a sense of grief. And then perhaps coming out of that, maybe there can be a new reconciliation we can see in Muslim New Zealanders, people whom we must love, whom we love because they are made in God's image. They are people like us. We should learn to love our Muslim neighbors. There should be a new sense of reconciliation. Although to some people maybe, some people have hard hearts and they continue to reject other people. I think maybe we can learn and apply this to God's gift. In human beings, in my heart, there is untruth. There is evil. In all of us, we are rebels against God. And one day, 2,000 years ago, at the first Easter, that untruth and that hatred just burst out and the innocent was killed. God's peace child. God's son, because of human sin, he was nailed to a cross to die. I crucified him. We can each say that. I crucified him. It was my sin that puts him there. And as we think of God's son hanging on that cross, dying for us, maybe we can feel the sense of horror. What have we done? What has happened in our world that the Creator should come in the person of Jesus and we kill Him? And then there is maybe the sense of grief. And then as we think of the death of God's innocent Son, there is this movement for reconciliation. 
I must come back to God. Accept his peace child, although there can be those who are hard-hearted and say, I will not change. I might go on a little bit longer. Here is another passage that Paul wrote about reconciliation. Up till now, we've mainly thought about reconciliation with God. Jesus came, Jesus died, that we might be reconciled, friends of God. But here in his letter to Ephesus, Paul writes how people can be reconciled with each other through Christ through the death of Jesus. And we saw that on the video, didn't we? Tribes who were killing each other. When they accept God's peace child, then they come to be friends with each other. Let's read this together, all, all together. At that time, Paul writes, you were apart from Christ and you were foreigners and did not belong to God's chosen people. You had no part in the covenants, God's agreements, which were based on God's promises to his people. And you lived in this world without hope and without God. But now, in union with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own body, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. He abolished the Jewish law with its commandments and rules in order to create of the two races one new people in union with himself, in this way making peace. By his death on the cross, Christ destroyed their enmity. By means of the cross, he united both races into one body and brought them back to God. So Christ came and preach the good news of peace to all, to you Gentiles who are far away from God, and to the Jews who were near to him. It is through Christ that all of us, Jews and Gentiles, were able to come in the one Spirit into the presence of the Father. One Spirit. Now, that's what makes global such an amazing taste of heaven. We come from all around the world, one spirit in the presence of Christ. And here is my summary of those verses we read. At the center, the climax, the key point in blue, we, God has created one new people in union with with Christ. This is the miracle of the cross. We are one new people. Yes, our cultures are very precious. Keep hold of your culture. Enjoy it. But in Christ, we are children of God. We are fully equal. There are no slaves, no free people, no men, no women, which div none of these barriers which divide. We are one in union with Christ. And then we look at the green on either side. Verse 14, Christ's body has brought peace and broken down the wall that separated. The wall that separated people from each other has been broken down. Verse 16, Christ's death has brought unity, has destroyed the enmity. This is what happens in a new people. Then move out again, the orange writing. In Christ, we were far away, but now we are brought near, near to the heart of God, near to the very heart of our heavenly Father. And verse 17, Christ's peace comes to Gentiles who are far and Jews who are near. And then looking at the red writing, Paul says, look, originally 
you are apart, you Gentiles, you Greeks, you Romans, whoever, you are apart from Christ, you are foreigners. But now, through Christ, you Jews, you Greeks, whoever, are one. See, Paul was a Pharisee. He was a very nationalistic Jew. And the, the Greeks and the Romans, well, they, they had many gods, they had many idols, they worshipped in, in temples which the Jews didn't like. The people despised each other. But when they came together in Christ, there was no Greek, no Roman, no Jew, one in Christ. Can I tell you another very lovely story? It's a true story. Have you had this story in Global in the last few years? I think Don said no. The story of Karori? This is a story of how people come together when they hear the story of Jesus. How God's peace child makes us new people. Tarori was a little Maori girl who lived, well, she was born about 1825. So early in colonial history. And when she was about 11 years old, some missionaries came to her village uh, near Matamata. So, you know, you know probably as Hobbit country, uh, but in uh, Waharoa. And they taught her to read. And little Tarori learned to read very quickly in one year. And as a reward, they gave her a copy of the Gospel of Luke which is one of the stories of Jesus. Te rongapai aruka. And she used to read it to the people of her village. Now, in those times, the Maori also were at war. But as she read the story of Jesus, this little 12-year-old girl, the story of Jesus touched their hearts and it changed them. And Tarori's dad was the chief, Ngakuku. And he said, we will go the way of Jesus. We will no longer go to war. But there was fighting around. So one day, the children and some of the adults left Waharoa to go to Tauranga because it was dangerous being where they were. And they went as far as the Wairere Falls, these beautiful falls where they were going to sleep the night. And as they slept, some warriors from a neighboring tribe, Te Arawa tribe, found them sleeping. And some of them could, some of the, the people of um, Tarori's group could run into the bush. But Tarori woke up and found these warriors. And one of them hit her with his club and killed her. Young Tarori died, and the warrior Uita saw her Bible, her te her Luke's Gospel, in a little bag around her neck. And so he took it. He thought, maybe I can sell it and make some money. So Uita, the warrior, took Tarori's Bible, and he and his people went back to their tribe in Rotorua. And meanwhile, Ngakuku took Tarori's body back to Waharoa. And people said, we must take revenge. You know, there was a good word in Maori for revenge. Utu. We must take revenge. And the chief Ngakuku said, no. We are going the way of Jesus. There will be no more bloodshed. Too many people have died. Um, we will leave justice to God. But the warrior who killed um, Karori, Tarori gave her Bible. He could not read. He gave her little book to a traveling person who could read called um, Ripahau. And Ripahau started to read the story of Jesus to these warriors. And as she read, their hearts were touched. And they decided to go the way of Jesus. And Uita said, I must go back to Tarori's dad and apologize and confess. Now, that was a dangerous thing. 
That was a dangerous thing to go back to the father of the child you had killed. But according to Maori stories, as the two men approached, as Uita the murderer approached Tarori the grieving father, they ran to each other with tears streaming down their faces and they hugged each other. You see, the story of Jesus brings reconciliation between human beings. These men were reconciled. The story doesn't finish there. Other people traveled to the South Island. There was a great Maori chief who had killed a lot of people in the South Island. His son became a follower of Jesus as he heard the gospel of Luke being read. And Te Raparaha went down to the South Island to confess the sins of his father, the great chief Te Raparaha. You can still find Tarori's grave near Matamata. And many people go there to remember this little girl whose gospel of Luke had brought peace to the people, to the Maori of New Zealand. God's Spirit did amazing work um, amongst the Maori. And in fact, when the colonialists took the Maori land, I almost feel as if it, were, it was a religious war because so many Maori were Christian. So many Pakeha Europeans were not Christian. And it was the Maori who were persecuted. I don't know. How much time have I got? Keep going. Do you know this icon? I just roughly traced it from a, a photograph from Vietnam. Okay. Kim Phuc. You know this story? The Napalm Girl, 1972. This photograph which was shown around the world. I was a boy. I remember the photograph, a little child in Vietnam who was, had napalm dropped on her. Do you know that that young girl, um, she grew up. Um, she went to university. She studied to be a doctor, but she always had the scars of the napalm on her back, which caused her incredible pain. But one day she ran away from the Vietnamese government, she felt she was being used for propaganda purposes and she sought a political asylum and she lived in Canada. She became a Christian. Do you know that part of the story? Napalm girl became a Christian and she said, I have forgot, forgiven the people who have done this to me. Now when she accepted the gospel of Jesus. She knew she had to forgive those who had wronged her. She said, I'm not religious, I'm not political, but religion doesn't help me at all. But the relationship between me and God and Jesus, that changed my life. It brought Kim physical and emotional peace in the midst of hatred, bitterness, pain, loss, hopelessness when the pain seemed insurmountable. She spoke at many places in America, um, preaching peace and reconciliation through Jesus. Once there was an American who had been in the Air Force in Vietnam, and he had lived with the agony of what had happened in that war. And after she had spoken, he went up to her and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And tears streamed down his face. And Kim Phuc said, I forgive you, I forgive you, I forgive you. Isn't that a beautiful picture? This man who had lived with the torture of what happened in Vietnam, knowing he is forgiven by one of the victims of that inhumanity. God brings peace. When we know that God has given us his peace child, then we reach out in peace to others. God brings peace, reconciliation between him and us. He brings peace, reconciliation between people. But just to complete this talk very briefly, God will bring peace to his whole creation. We look around and we see disease. We see tsunamis. 
we see terrible things happening and we say, God, if you are there, how can there be such agony in our world? Again, St. Paul tells us, God will one day reconcile through the cross the whole world to himself. Should we read this together? This is just a short one, but a wonderful passage also from St. Paul. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. Reconcile. We didn't see it in that translation. The word reconcile is there. Through the Son, then, God decided to reconcile all things to himself. I have read about this piece of um, art. It's called the Tree of Life. And it was um, commissioned, it was organized by Christian Aid and the British Museum. So you will see it in um, the British Museum. It's a lovely looking tree made of metal. Do you know what else it's made out of? Guns. Okay. There's a close up. There was a terrible war in Mozambique. An enormous loss of life. And then when the big party politics pulled out, the people made peace. And they collected all the guns, like uh, hopefully will happen in New Zealand, all the semi-automatics. And in Mozambique, these artists, they welded the guns into a tree of life. That is a picture of what God will do in his creation when the work of Christ is completed. I quote from one of my favorite theologians, he, Tom Wright says, the new creation begun at Easter time will one day be complete. It's not complete yet. There's still war, there's still suffering, there's still disease, there's still cancer. It will one day be complete and then there will be full healing, full understanding, full reconciliation. Reconciliation, that's been our theme today. Full consolation. The plant has been sown. The, the seed is already growing. God is at work in his world. Work with God in his ministry of reconciliation. Let's pray. Lord, when we think of Easter... we see your Son, the man Jesus upon whom your fullness dwells, in whom your fullness dwells, hanging on the cross to reconcile us to God. Lord, we are no longer strangers from you. When we come to you in faith, we are your children. We are loved. We are beloved by you. We are part of your family, part of your kingdom. Lord, may we know the joy of reconciliation through Jesus. Now lead us, Lord, in our conversation. For Jesus' sake. Amen. I have selected a story that Jesus told. I suggest you read it together, right around the table. So if, if, if you aren't very good in English, just practice reading. So everybody has a go. And then see if you can answer some of these questions and work down to the number six. Relate the story you have read to me, to us personally.